Okay, uh, last but not least, it's a pleasure to introduce Ziad Benim. Uh, we're all really excited to hear about your living history. Please take it away. Oh, thank you so much. Uh, how the heck do you follow that? I, I really want to thank all of the previous speakers and the organizers for this amazing opportunity to give an unconventional talk. And, and more practically, actually, a break from unpacking moving boxes, because you see, uh, I recently resigned from an assistant professor position. So let's see if my, yeah, there you go. So I am Ziad Ganim. And yeah, so what, what happened? Uh, let's hear the story. But first, let's go back, way, way back. And it goes a little something like this. So uh, as we know, around 2000 years ago in the Middle East, there were rumbles and religions were splitting and forming. Uh, and as we know now, a central figure that emerged from this period, Yeshua, Jesus Christ, who is the ideolo ideological leader for an anti-establishment um, perspective. And there were others uh, there at that time. So names you will recognize like John the Baptist, uh, Yohanna and Mahmedan. And it just so happens Christianity follows the story of uh, Jesus Christ and Mandianism follows the story of John the Baptist. And there are lots of similarities and differences. Um, you can do something like draw a Venn diagram between Christianity, Judaism, and Mandianism. And uh, you'll see there's something in, in every segment there. And uh, here we see on the left, uh, some religious artwork um, showing uh, Mandians kind of looking out at the sky on a, on a probably a reed uh, thatched boat. And on the right, you see them frolicking in the water and uh, baptizing as, uh, as a tradition in the, in the religion. And all four of my grandparents uh, grew up in this tradition. And so, yeah, not enough time really to like tell uh, lots and lots of stories, but one, one kind of uh, generational thread that I will elucidate for you is that uh, my, my paternal grandfather uh, was born in a village. So in the south of Iraq, in this kind of marshy land uh, in the south of Iraq. And he made the big bold step of moving from village to a city, moved to Baghdad. And this enabled him to bring home a typewriter, a radio and a television. And uh, for, my, uh, for my young father who was aware that he had relatives, you know, um, living in, in villages, this was uh, really kind of an, an eye-opening thing. And it had a, such a huge impact on him that it had a ripple, huge impact on, on me. Um, so the generational line continues. Uh, my father and mother moved from Iraq to the US, which was obviously an outstanding decision because I would not probably be here today if, uh, if I was born in, uh, in Iraq, a uh, really um, amazing foresight on, uh, on their behalf. Um, but you can see here uh, in this picture, I think it was on my fifth birthday, uh, obviously very pleased uh, to be getting a computer. And so even though uh, our family was kind of lower middle class, um, my father was so uh, struck by the impact of technology. And he's like, you know, we, we, we gotta get this kid a, a computer. And I have been playing with computers ever since um, and reaping innumerable paybacks from just having this helper brain that, that I can communicate with uh, so fluently. Um, and uh, yeah, it's one of the things that regardless of career paths and changes, this has been uh, constant and uh, such a great thing. And so uh, fast forward to my um, uh, research experience. Oh yeah, there's a little bit of uh, Dungeons and Dragons too, I guess growing up. Uh, so fast forward to um, research experience. Um, I was a pre-med undergraduate uh, just until I got this research experience when I completely fell in love. It was really uh, love at first sight. And the research group was studying this protein rhodopsin. And so as you all probably know, every chemical reaction in your body uh, that, uh, that your body cares about, it has a finger on by means of an enzyme, uh, which is usually a protein and maybe RNA. And so this is the protein that allows vision. 
And the way it works is in addition to the polypeptide chain, which is shown in purple, there's the small uh, organic molecule, retinal, uh, which is bound at the, at the core of the protein shown here in red. And when light hits uh, this protein, um, the retinal molecule isomerizes, it changes shape, and it allows G protein to, uh, to bind uh, rhodopsin. So how does this energy exchange occur between this really small twisted organic molecule and this much, much bigger um, part of the same molecule, actually, they're, they're covalently bound. Uh, so what you want to do in, as an experiment is if you, you want to kind of follow this from the, the perspective of this small molecule as isomerizing is you want to kind of ignore the protein. Um, but molecules embedded in this protein and then there's just like 55 molar water. So um, how on earth can you look at the carbon carbon bonds just in that small little red part when there are thousands of other carbon carbon bonds in the, in the same molecule. And uh, the way this works, uh, at least the, the approach this uh, Matthews group had was to use resonance Raman spectroscopy. So this exploits the, the fact that this organic group has an electronic resonance that absorbs visible light. You know, it's, it's part of the function of the protein. And the rest of the protein, uh, as anyone who has looked at egg whites can tell you, is, is colorless. And uh, what the lab had found uh, is in, in studying the intermediates um, in this isomerization pathway with resonance Raman spectroscopy, um, some um, Raman spect uh, segment of a Raman spectrum shown there on the right. And they saw this really very bizarre thing, uh, which is that uh, these two hydrogen out of plane vibrations were decoupled across a double bond. And if, if you think about that, that's, that's really bizarre from a physics perspective. You have two identical springs connected by a rigid rod. And it'd be hard to think of a way to isolate one from the other, given that they're the, the same chemical species and they're like right next to each other. Uh, but indeed, you can deuterate one and the other one hardly moves. So what the heck is going on? And uh, so th this was, um, as I was just kind of making my first steps in lab, I could really jump into the theory. And so this was a theoretical investigation. And so hypothesis number one was, it's the inhomogeneous electrostatic environment and the protein that's giving kind of a different stark shift to these two different protons. And that's why they're, they're not coupled to one another. Um, turned out that's not the case. In <laughs> uh, doing the control calculations for that, I just varied the structure and did something silly, which is twisting a double bond by like 40 degrees. And, and then in the electronic ground state, you can find that these protons are, are decoupled. So it's really not a, a strange electrostatic environment uh, to speak of, but really it's just a ground state twist um, in, this, in this molecule, um, which tells us that although this uh, photo product uh, spectroscopically, you can measure the, the formation of it and you find that it's formed in 200 femtoseconds, there's still more of the isomerization occurring in, in the ground state. The, the elect electronic part of that uh, transition is just so fast. And that's what makes it so efficient. It's one of the most efficient um, um, kind of energy capture uh, reactions. And the it teaches us an easy rule, which is very generally applicable, uh, which is if you want to make the chemical reaction efficient, just make the pathway you want to be the fastest one. And if, if all the other ones are slower, then your pathway will, will win out and, uh, and, and, and you win. Uh, the problem is you have to be thinking about engineering lifetimes and we're not wired to think about that. People are um, usually in, in biophysics, biochemistry, interested in thinking about the structure. What is the structure? What, what does it look like? Not how does it move? How does it wiggle? How does it uh, exchange energy with its environment? And so, okay, so uh, after undergraduate, I was going into graduate school, really interested to learn more about how uh, proteins can control every reaction uh, in our bodies. And uh, yeah, so this is what this chromophore looks like. Sorry, I should have switched this slide earlier. You can see here's uh, the state of the chromophore at 200 femtoseconds and, um, oh, maybe you're not seeing the pointer. Here are these two, two protons that you can see uh, sufficiently twisted that they're, they're no, longer, um, no longer coupled. Okay. Okay, so uh, the problem is with applying vibrational spectroscopy is outside from the special cases where, you know, the, the protein's job to um, absorb light, uh, if you just look at general infrared or, or Raman spectrum of a protein, you see there's 
broad blobs and you're doing kind of broad blob analysis. And so what I found exciting in graduate school and then um, playing on the, uh, my interest in vibrational spectroscopy which is two dimensional infrared spectroscopy. And so uh, this is what I found to be the most exciting thing going on uh, at that time. And it's absolutely correct. Uh, so what it does yeah. is it takes, yes. Sorry to interrupt, but that's your uh, couple of minutes warning. Okay, sounds good. Um, and so what the two dimensional infrared spectroscopy does is it, is it spreads uh, the spectra over an additional dimension. So now in addition to seeing just those uh, bands in the, where the resonances are in the FTIR, you can see couplings between them. You can see how these vibrations exchange information, uh, exchange energy and coherence with one another. And you could take your, your favorite um, biochemical uh, process that involves a protein and, and look at it through the lens of how these uh, uh, CO double bonds um, uh, stretching vibrations report on that on that reaction. Okay, so uh, at the at the end of graduate school, I was um, very I would say dumbstruck uh, by the, the simplicity of, of uh, single molecule experiments, and so. Let's go to here. So um, this isn't this isn't data. This is a, obviously a, a calculation. Uh, but the observable that corresponds to this is is, is the end to end length of a protein that you can measure um, holding a single molecule in place with the optical tweezers. And what you would be able to see as this protein is is. Um, refolding is a, just a decrease in this end-to-end this -end length. And you see this in a, in a very simple way. And in contrast to vibration and spectroscopy, the data is really very simple. You just have length versus time or fluorescence versus time, and you don't need a uh, really a very complicated uh, explanation. And what it does is it, it solves one of the problems um, in ultrafast spectroscopy, which is uh, you don't need to synchronize anything when you look at a single molecule. If you're doing, if you're doing an ultrafast spectroscopy, um, you, you can get lots of structural information about what is occurring uh, in, the, in a reaction, but you have to be able to start you know, the whole ensemble or, or a significant uh, measurable portion of that ensemble reacting. And you don't have to do that if you're looking at a single molecule, you just sit there and, and, and watch it. And uh, so the, the combining these two um, ventures, let's go. Here um, was the uh, focus of a research group at Yale um, University in the Department of Chemistry. Uh, so bringing the uh, single molecule biophysics type experiments that I learned how to do as a, as a postdoc and bringing those into the world of um, organic solvents and uh, chemical reactions taking place outside of a biological context. And so we had to re-engineer the, uh, the whole optical tweezers construct and I, I will say without a doubt, the, the thing I'm most proud of that came out of uh, this time is the, the uh, wonderful individuals that graduated from my lab. If you think anything in this talk is halfway interesting, um, go, go look at what my former postdocs, uh, Jinxing Huang and Masha Kamenetska are, are doing really fabulous uh, research. You can follow any of the uh, alumni from my lab and, and find the fantastic work uh, that they're doing and very, very uh, proud of the, the work that they're continuing to do. Uh, and it just so happens that, you know, at some periods of uh, time in life, you know, you think of yourself as this river um, kind of flowing along and uh, yeah, life is always downhill. So you're kind of flow, uh, flowing downhill, sometimes fast, sometimes uh, more gently. And you, you see some rocks building up ahead in one direction and a clearing of rocks in, a, in another direction. So you could just kind of pivot and, and flow that way. And uh, I, I would say I've, I've really had a, a blast uh, since starting at Moderna in February. Um, so I can't tell you at all about anything that I'm, I'm working on, but um, you may be able to extrapolate from everything that I've told you before this, uh, how I see the world and uh, what my interests are. And I'll tell you the scientist is uh, the science is more fascinating and more exciting um, than, than I, I came away with um, the impression from the, the interview and it, it's really been um, fantastic and uh, really so so in, so enjoyable um, despite the fact that moving is a pain in the butt <laughs> not fun to do that but 
yeah, it's, it's, it's really been uh, fantastic. I'd be happy to uh, answer any questions for anybody. All right. Thank you so much for this great talk. Um, we are running over time, but um, are there any burning questions uh, to the end? Um, okay, if not, then I think we can maybe wrap up. And uh, thank you very much again for your presentation, Ziad. I'll hand it over back to Shri. Thank you.